so let's talk about Fortress. Fortress, a lesson in survival. <laughs> no, not that one. Fortress. Get to the fortress. Oh, <laughs> God, no. No, Fortress is a sci-fi adventure set in a dystopian future, where having more than one child is a big no-no. Our protagonists are sent to a maximum security prison. But this isn't your average slammer, oh no. This is a high-tech hellscape complete with deadly traps, robot guards, and a warden so twisted, he makes Norman Bates look well-adjusted. So let's dive into this review, and then we'll talk about the making, production, and the casting. Because, when you can't get Arnold Schwarzenegger, who better than Christopher Lambert? Bullshit. Fortress was written by the dynamic duo of Troy Neighbors and Steven Feinberg. Now they were so good, it's pretty much the only movie they ever wrote. But let's not forget Stuart Gordon, a director with a track record of creating cinematic gold. Movies like Reanimator, Robot Jocks, and Honey I Shrunk the Kids. We're introduced to our hero John Brennick, played by Christopher Lambert, and his partner, played by Lauren Loughlin. They're sneaking through the US border to Vancouver, when Brennick suddenly turns into a fashion critic and calls out his partner's military collar that's on show. So they're having to go through this security checkpoint, getting scanned from head to toe, and then a woman is discovered to be pregnant, and suddenly alarms start going off and she's dragged away. Hmm, America stopping pregnant women's rights? That sounds familiar. Brennick being so nervous he can't remember his own luggage, but luckily for him, the kind officer hands it over. But then he spots that his partner's wearing a UNEF uniform. Looks like these two need to work on their covert skills. Or maybe just get a better mirror. Anyway, things get intense and they both start kicking ass before making a run to the border. Good thing nobody has any guns. Instead, they... Release the hounds. But being a true hero, Brennick sacrifices himself to give his partner a fighting chance to escape, as he's savagely attacked by a pack of vicious dogs who chomp down on Lambert's arm like it's a tasty treat. Talk about taking one for the team. Brennick's then packed into a seatless bus like a sardine, and he's forced to listen to this guy blabbering about the prison they're going to. You know this place? Did a feature on this place. This place is enormous. The place is apparently 30 stories high. Are we sure it's not Lambert's forehead? <coughs> Turns out the prison is underground, and it's smack dab in the middle of a desert. Brennick's got to serve 31 years because his partner was carrying their bunny me oven. Although, I'm not sure how he knew about this if they got away. They then order everyone to strip down to their birthday suits, giving everybody an unexpected eyeful of man candy. I just hope Lambert remembered to manscape down there beforehand. We then get a brief introduction to the man in charge, none other than Kurtwood Smith. <laughs> as prison director Poe. And fun fact, the original role was actually meant for Richard E. Grant, but ended up going to Smith instead. Grant was also in the running for playing Dr. Clemens in Alien 3, another sci-fi flick set in a prison. Looks like he missed out on that one too. Balls! Poe reveals that they're worth $27 a day. The federal government pays men till $27 every day for each one of them. Not bad for a captive audience. <laughs> but he also says your thoughts will be with me always hmm what does that mean i wonder mcleod uh, sorry brennick gets fitted with an intestinator the message on the screen tells him not to cross the red line crossing a red line will result all of this gives me some serious Total Recall vibes. When you the crunch, you're there. 
I mean, let's be real. You can see why they wanted Arnie for this role. No offense, Lambert. You son of a bitch! So this guy suddenly develops a serious case of claustrophobia. I have an illness. Now it's called claustrophobia. It's a real illness! I mean, come on, he was fine squeezing his buns on that overcrowded bus. But no, he freaks out so much, his intestinator goes haywire, and he wiggles all the way to the red line like a worm. Which turns out to be the end of a line for him. Literally. Talk about a short sentence. We then get this cool view of a prison and a message about the neutron cannon, which apparently has the power to destroy organic material. Nice warm welcome. Brennick and his new buddy from not the good Star Trek series what? then make their way to the cell, where they encounter none other than Jeffrey Coombs. Best known to me from his role in the good Star Trek series, Deep Space Nine. Oh, 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 oh. How delightful. He of course played the role of Herbert West in Stuart Gordon's earlier movie, Reanimator. This guy then tells Brennick not to dream. Don't dream. As if it's just that easy, like flipping a switch. Like, oh sure, let me turn off my subconscious and I'll get right on that. Maybe he'll suggest not breathing next, because that seems just as doable. And of course Brennick has a steamy dream about doing his wife. And Poe is secretly monitoring like some kind of pervert. And just when things are starting to get juicy, Poe decides to cock block and administers. This is an unauthorized thought process. <laughs> the only thing orgasming here is Brennick's intestinator. So then Bennett from Commando, you know, the guy with the epic moustache, right. decides he's going to try and get frisky with Brennick's new buddy. A fight breaks out and we all end up in these standing cells, which is basically like a timeout, but for adults. They then start getting questioned, and instead of just calling Bennett out as the creepy perv he is, Brennick decides to take one for the team, and lands himself in trouble with Poe. Poe's getting a shave from one of Brennick's cellmates, and we get a small insight into Brennick's past. Poe then shows him a live feed of his wife showering, who's also in prison. And then, just to show his balls, he intestinates them both. Intestinate Karen Brennick. Intestination commencing. You bastard. <laughs> Whilst eating a cheap takeaway on the stairs, he then asks where the woman's section is. Where's the women's section? Bennett then starts a fight again, kicking Brennick's ass. I guess he didn't like getting cock blocked either. They then start fighting on this bridge, which Poe then removes. Brennick wins the fight, but then Poe over the tannoy tells him to end it. 42910 is no longer of any use. I have a death warrant in his name. Execute at 95763. But Brennick isn't taking orders from any creepy pervert. Instead, he tries to save Bennett's life. His wife then overhears everyone cheering his name. But Poe isn't impressed, and he sends down this machine, which shoots a massive hole in Bennett. Like something out of death becomes her. I have a hole in my stomach! But it turns out that Bennett's usefulness has started in death, as his corpse has left behind an intestinator for Brennick to steal. Talk about a killer souvenir. Brennick then gets put into this Vitruvian man centrifuge thing. They then drag his wife into the room like a sack of potatoes. She tells him, He says I should tell you to cooperate. You just told me. The machine then starts to do the classic spin until you forgot who you are method. Brennick's mind then starts tripping on psychedelic hallucinations, as if he's in some weird 80s music video. But instead of pretty colours, he sees geometric shapes, slivering snakes, and his wife's assets. Hmm. 
It's all a bit too overwhelming and he reaches breaking point where he can't take it anymore and decides to rip out his eyes. Poe decides to play matchmaker and he tells Brennick's wife that if she wants to save her husband from a mind wipe chamber, she's going to have to live with him. Talk about a twisted way to get a date. She agrees and Brennick's returned to his cell looking like a zombie extra from Dawn of the Dead. The only thing missing is his craving for brains. brains. <laughs> Just when you thought things couldn't get any weirder, Brennick's wife then walks in on Poe, who's hooked up to some machine like a futuristic cow getting milked. Turns out Poe is some kind of next level human with ports and gizmos, and he needs some monthly amino acid injections. A guy's gotta get his nutrients right. But Brennick's mind is still more scrambled than a plate of eggs. His wife then drugs Poe with a glass of champagne. Looks like Poe can't handle his liquor. She then plays Inception and hops into Brennick's scrambled brain using a dream machine. She then finds him as a child stuck in a deep dark hole. Help me please! I fell down the well! I'll get help laddie! And somehow manages to pull him out. With Brennick now awake, we find out that he's been in this state for four months. Jeez, lady, take your time. His cellmate then has a sneaky conversation with Brennick's wife. I've been talking to your husband. I'm John's cellmate. You're telling me they've been there for four months and never spoke? That's more ridiculous than Lambert's forehead. She then snatches a holographic lens, almost like she's on a crystal maze. Will you start the fans, please? Wayun, I mean Brunt, no, I mean D-Day, then offers to take the Intestinator apart to better understand it. He then does so on a porno mag, providing one son for all, men can multitask. Brennick's wife then slips Abe with a holographic crystal. With the use of D-Day's glasses and the laser barrier, they're able to project the lens to make the map. Because clearly projecting the map in the middle of your cell is the most practical and inconspicuous way to do this. Poe then tells Brennick's wife to divorce her husband and stay with him instead. And if she agrees, he'll set Brennick free. She responds with, mm, let me think about it as if she's deciding between two flavours of ice cream, rather than a lifelong commitment to a perverted cyborg. D-Day then thinks he's found a way to disarm the Intestinator, and may try it out on Tommy Towels. He then throws up the Intestinator, like it was the last bite of a dodgy kebab he should never have ordered. Meanwhile, the computer system Zed, interestingly voiced by the director's wife, lays out all the evidence that Poe has done a colossal screw-up, and then drops the bombshell that he's being replaced like some defective battery. Your replacement will be here within 24 hours. Brennick and his fellow cellmates then stick their intestinators to a big pipe and get into a full-on brawl. Zed, who apparently didn't get the memo that Bennett was dead, let off some steam Bennett, starts intestination. Poe tries to intervene, but the whole thing ends in a massive explosion and a hole in the pipe. Anyway, Brennick and his cellmates then make an escape through the pipe, and Zed allows Poe back in charge, who starts spraying them with steam like some deranged barista. Tommy Towels, in a moment of weakness, then throws in the towel and surrenders, only to be awarded with a shower of bullets. Abe then tries to sneak Brennick's wife out of Poe's quarters, but Poe catches him in the act and gives him a chokehold so tight even Darth Vader would be impressed. All too easy. Meanwhile, some wannabe Borg drone tries to join the pipe party, attempting to roast Brennick and his crew with a flamethrower. Brennick then unleashes his inner Rambo and rips off the machine gun arm and starts blasting away the attacking Borg drones. We have engaged the Borg. I mean the Mentel soldiers. 
D-Day's glasses then fly off his face and he just stands there shouting waiting to get blasted by this Borg reject. Thankfully it explodes right before taking aim. Talk about an explosive situation. <laughs> they then somehow get into Poe's quarters where they find Abe dead and Brennick's wife about to go under the knife. Brennick orders Poe to take him there. He agrees, but Zed has gone rogue and it makes the Neutron Cannon shoot Poe into a pool of blue goo. Like the insides of a smurf. Trapped in Poe's office with more soldiers on the way. You're trapped here, Brennick. A team of strike ones are on the way. D-Day offers to screw up the Zed computer with some on-the-fly virus he just makes. While doing so, two soldiers just strut in and fill him full of lead, just while Brennick stood there daydreaming. I mean, I know Lambert has myopia, but come on, pal. Despite being riddled with bullets, they prop D-Day up and he manages to press the enter key, unleashing the virus before he takes his last breath. They then leave his body behind and Zed starts to go haywire. Zed's dead, baby. Dead. Meanwhile, Brennick makes his dramatic entrance to rescue his wife, just in time. Who really needs Arnie when you've got Christopher Lambert? <laughs> Brennick, his wife, and his buddy Miko, who's miraculously still alive, hot wire a truck and make it for the Mexican border. Just in time too, as Brennick's wife goes into labour, so they end up stopping at this random farmhouse. But Mentel isn't done with them yet, as their truck suddenly gains sentience as if it's just come off the set of Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> it then runs over Nico like a cheap speed bump. Brennick tries to shoot it, but in the ultimate action hero cliche, he's out of bullets. So what does he do? He sets it on fire, of course. Just as the truck hurtles towards the farmhouse where his wife was, but luckily, she's escaped with their new child. Talk about a happy ending. Even though they've watched their cellmates get slaughtered, their trucks turned into a homicidal maniac, they've narrowly escaped being burned alive, at least they're a family now. And we're left thinking, did anyone notice Nico died? Dead on arrival. Interestingly, the Australian VHS of the film omits the final battle between Brennick and the truck. The film cuts from a truck driving through the fence at the Mexican border to Brennick and his partner sitting on an old tractor clutching their newborn. So as I mentioned earlier, Arnold Schwarzenegger was in line to play John Brennick and he was actually excited about it, partly because he was a huge fan of Reanimator, in which Arnold's stunt double, Peter Kent, had a small role. In an interview, Stuart Gordon said, It was Arnold Schwarzenegger that got me the job, and it was because of Reanimator. We used Arnold's body double in Reanimator. The first Reanimated corpse is a guy named Peter Kent, Arnold's double. He's got those big muscles. He got Arnold to see Reanimator, and Arnold liked it so much that he had a screening of it in his home, inviting all these people, including producer John Davis. John had the rights to Fortress, and Arnold was going to do it. For some reason, I'm not sure why, Arnold finally decided that he wasn't going to do the movie and dropped out. They had a big budget, probably like $60 million, $70 million, which was a huge budget in those days. Now it sounds small. <laughs> anyway, he dropped out and the budget went down. They cut the budget to about $15 million. Ironically, one of the taglines for the movie was more powerful than Total Fortress was also nominated for a Saturn Award in 1994 in the Best Science Fiction category, but lost out to Spielberg's Jurassic Park. It's not like Lambert had a chance against a genetically engineered dinosaur on the loose. Talk about an unfair fight. Fortress was filmed at Warner Brothers Movie World in Queensland, Australia. Publicity claimed that it was the biggest movie set ever to be built in Australia at that point. In an interview with Den of Geek, Stuart Gordon said, 
That was a lot of fun because we shot it in Australia. We were in a place called Surfer's Paradise, which was the most beautiful beach in the world. Turquoise water and white sand. And here we are making this movie that's supposed to be in this dark future. You know, the deepest shithole on Earth. The contrast was pretty incredible. Although it's stated that much of the film was shot on location at a real prison, the cast and crew had to sign waivers stating they would not be rescued if inmates were to take them hostage. At one point, a prison official gave several cast members safety vests to wear for their protection, but promptly told the cast members he wasn't sure that it would help if there was a riot, because they usually go for your eyes anyway. Gouge his eyes! Despite being filmed in Australia, the movie had very few Australian actors in it, which caused some friction with the Australian Actors Equity Organisation. The reason for shooting in Australia is that the movie would have cost 30% more had it been done in the US. In an interview, producer John Flock said, We went to Equity and said, We are producing this film here. We would like to have it certified as an Australian production. So we'll only bring in the three American actors because it's much cheaper for us to work as an Equity certified film. Equity came back to us and said, No, you have an American producer and three non-Australian actors, so we're going to treat you as an offshore company. So I said, Well, okay, that's fine. But if that's the case, we're not going to agree that this is an Australian production and I can bring in as many Americans as I want. So... We then brought in seven American actors, at which point Equity said, We had no idea you were going to bring in that many actors. We're going to take a second look at this. They then really gave us a hard time. By and large, the savings in Australia are in the range of 20 to 30% below the line. Now they're offset a bit by electing to fly in a principal cast and an American director, and by not hiring locals. It states that internationally the film grossed $40 million, turning it into a very profitable movie for having been shot on a budget of just $14 million. The film also enjoyed a long profitable afterlife on VHS. It's been said that this movie is just a fancy sci-fi redo of the film Lock Up from 1989. In that movie, Sylvester Stallone stars as a mechanic who gets sent to a prison run by evil warden Donald Sutherland, who bears a grudge against him. It's hard to ignore some of the similarities. D-Day's backstory also echoes a futuristic prison flick. The movie states, First Intercontinental Bank building? I blew that safe like it was fucking butter, man. And the only problem was my partners didn't appreciate my work, turned my ass in. Which sounds suspiciously similar to the backstory of Frank Warren, the protagonist in Wedlock from 1991, played by Rudger Hauer. Warren was also an electronics expert and thief, but he stole diamonds instead of cash, and of course he was betrayed by his partners and sent to an experimental prison camp, Holiday, where they had to wear high-tech devices to keep them from escaping. At times, it seems as if Hollywood writers have a limited number of plot lines in their toolbox. And I can't help but wonder what this movie might have been like had they had the bigger budget. I mean, I'm not saying they needed Arnie to make it work, although if they had, it probably would have been a blockbuster hit, with explosions and one-liners galore. Wrong. But seriously, with more money they could have at least have afforded some better sets and special effects. The film sets feel small and bland, even for a prison, and let's face it, the effects have aged better than Christopher Lambert himself. Despite this, the movie more than makes up for it with its charm and engaging storyline. Sure, the script can be a little heavy-handed at times, but it manages to keep the audience invested in the plot. Lambert, Coombs and Smith all give stellar performances, 
and the direction of Stuart Gordon is nothing short of flawless. Lauren Lachlan gives it her best shot, but let's just say her acting chops weren't quite as strong as the prison's force fields. After Fortress, she disappeared from her acting scene for four years, and eventually stopped altogether in 1999. It's a bit of a mystery, but in 1990 she tied the knot with entrepreneur Victor Dry, a man with more money than Scrooge McDuck. I'm guessing she never had to worry about working again. Clifton Cullen Jr's performance is also a bit cringeworthy at times. However, we can cut him some slack since this was his first movie role. Bullshit, man. Fortress may have some imperfections, but they're outshined by its many merits. However, the same cannot be said about Fortress 2 Reentry. Anyway, that's all from me. If you've enjoyed this content, please like, subscribe and comment. It does mean a lot. Until next time, take it easy. is an unauthorized thought process.